On February the 24th, Russia launched a full-scale invasion of Ukraine. The war has since killed thousands, displaced millions, and destroyed entire cities. Despite international appeals for Volodymyr Zelensky and his family to be evacuated to a safe location, the 44-year-old president stayed in Kyiv with his defense forces. He has shifted the course of history through his actions and heartfelt words. His own son knows the names of weapons used in the war. He is hopeful that the next generation will not. When the United States offered to evacuate him from the combat zone, Zelensky gave one of his best lines. The fight is here. I need ammunition, not a ride. He has changed from, as he puts it, all the wisdom that I never wanted. Всі ми тут, наші військові тут, громадяни суспільства тут, всі ми тут. Захищаємо нашу незалежність, нашу державу. Так буде далі. It's hard to imagine how this bright, comedic family man has ended up in one of the most dangerous positions in the world with a giant target on his back. This is one of Europe's largest wars since World War II. Since then, Europe's map has been shaped by political alliances. But now, Putin wants to redraw Europe's map by force. He's long claimed that Ukraine belongs to Russia and they are one people. However, Ukraine is a sovereign country with its own language, culture and political system. While the two countries have a history, Ukraine has fought hard for its own identity. Ukraine was part of the Russian Empire in the 18th and 19th centuries. In 1917, the Russian Revolution brought down the empire and the region spiraled into civil war. This briefly allowed Ukraine to gain independence from Russian rule, but it was quickly taken over by the newly created Soviet Union as one of its first republics. Over the next decade, the Soviet Union brutally expanded its control. By the end of World War II, it had forged a sphere of influence over its bordering Western countries. The West held its influence over here. This essentially divided Europe and marked the period of the Cold War. The Soviet Union formed communist governments on their side, which were easy to control. But the West developed into democracies with capitalist economies. The deep ideological divide fueled distrust and tensions between the two sides, and soon these spheres hardened into military alliances. In 1949, several countries along with the US and Canada formed the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, NATO. They promised to defend each other from invasion. A few years later, the USSR and several of its neighboring countries formed the Soviet-led Warsaw Pact Alliance. Each side built up its military to protect itself from the other. A lot of people within the Soviet system regarded NATO as a hostile block against them. They, they regarded NATO as aggressively as NATO regarded the Soviet bloc. The big difference in NATO countries, historically, was that they were democracies, people were free, and people in the Soviet bloc weren't free, and if they tried to be free, such as they tried to be in Hungary in the 50s and, and, and Czechoslovakia in the 60s, the Soviets would invade them. When the Soviet Union collapses, you know, Russia, the, the angry bear, is licking its paws, and, and then suddenly all these former Soviet republics, like the Baltic republics and so on, all want to join NATO. They all want to join the EU. They, you know, that is regarded by people like Putin as aggressive. That's saying, hold on, these countries 
You know, they sort of belong to us, or they actually belong to us, and now they sort of belong to you. Putin sees these things just in terms of power blocks. He doesn't think about the fact that your average Estonian just wants to be you know, in a sovereign nation that's free to join whichever block it chooses. And if it doesn't want to be part of Russia, it doesn't want to be part of Russia. Europe remained this way for decades, until one side finally collapsed. By late 1991, republics like Ukraine started declaring independence from Soviet domination. The Soviet Union dissolved into 15 independent countries, including a much weaker Russia. But losing an empire that's far flung is, is a lot easier than losing an empire that is, that is contiguous, that's right on your borders. And so when the Soviet Union went, Russia loses everything on its borders. And, you know, some of them are more remote than others. That it hurt Russia a lot more to lose Ukraine than it did to, say, lose Tajikistan. The, the, it's geographically nearer, it's bigger, it's more important. The cultural ties are much more obvious. The Soviet sphere of influence disappeared as many countries overthrew their communist governments. Even though the Cold War ended, the alliance on the other side of Europe was still going strong. In fact, it was expanding. In 1999, Poland, Hungary and the Czech Republic joined NATO. In 2004, seven more countries joined. That moved NATO into the old Soviet sphere of influence, making NATO's border with Russia the longest it's ever been. Belarus, Ukraine and Georgia were now the last post-Soviet countries between Russia and NATO. Ukraine and Georgia both wanted to join NATO for a long time, making them prime targets for Russia. The problem is largely manufactured by Putin's paranoia, his crazy worldview that, that NATO is out to get him. You know, it's not. No one wants to invade Russia. Everyone just wants everybody to be happy, don't they? You know, just want to live at peace and be happy. Yet Putin's got this idea that the world always needs to be at war in some way. There always needs to be conflict. And making some kind of an agreement with the Russian Federation, some kind of a security collaboration agreement, earlier could have stopped Russia seeing NATO expansion as a threat to itself. Uh, it would have been a good step, a clever step, a, a really diplomatic step, because Russia was willing to do this at some point, even under Putin. Ukraine became a NATO partner in 1994, which brought them one step closer to becoming a member. In 2013, they were going to sign an association agreement with the European Union. However, when it came time to sign the deal, Ukraine's then pro-Russian government refused. Instead, they chose to strengthen ties with Russia. Pro-Europe citizens organized protests and occupations centered on and around Kiev's Maidan Nezilezhnosti in late November. Our goal is to join the European Union and is the first step to sign association agreement in Vilnius. But this president wants to sell the country in order to buy the power in the presidential office in 2015. And this is the key issue. He, he tries to get the bargain with Russians. You have protests against what was seen as a government that was ridiculously pro-Russian and pro-Putin. Putin was desperate for Yanushenko's government to stay in power. But of course, the Ukrainians took the streets, they didn't want it. And that, for Putin, was a real humiliation. As the protest in Kyiv's Independence Square continued into 2014, the government began cracking down on the demonstrators. The size of the protests only grew in reaction and turned into what was termed the Revolution of Dignity. In all, over 100 mostly civilian protesters died. The then President Yanukovych fled the country and Parliament voted to oust him and hold new elections. This meant Putin was losing political influence in Ukraine. 
ever since that kind of orange revolution you know, took pro-Russian puppet leaders out of Ukraine, replaced them with independent-minded figures, Putin really, really got bloodied and he hated it. And that's why he's always had this complete animus against Ukraine, which he regards as being Russian. And how dare these people be against Russia? They must have been infected by America and Britain and countries like that. And they must have been infected by some form of Nazism. President Putin says Russia is ready to look for diplomatic solutions over Ukraine but stresses his country's interests are non-negotiable. Then, addressing the world, he said, I have made the decision to carry out a special military operation. He may have called it a special military operation, but it's clear that this is a full-scale invasion of Ukraine. In the early hours of February 24th, shortly before the start of the Russian invasion, Zelensky recorded an address. He refuted claims by the Russian government about the presence of neo-Nazis in the Ukrainian government. He stated that he had no intention of attacking the Donbass region, whilst highlighting his connection to the area. In part of the address, he spoke in Russian to the people of Russia appealing to them to pressure their leadership to prevent war. С вами нас разделяют более 2000 километров общей границы. Вдоль нее сегодня стоят ваши войска, почти 200.000 солдат, тысячи боевых машин. Ваше руководство одобрило их шаг вперёд на территорию другой страны. И этот шаг этот шаг может стать началом большой войны на европейском континенте. In an early morning address that day, Zelensky said that his intelligence services had identified him as Russia's top target, but that he was staying in Kyiv and his family would remain in the country. He said, they want to destroy Ukraine politically by destroying the head of state. During the invasion, Zelensky has reportedly been the target of more than a dozen assassination attempts. Three were prevented due to tips from Russian FSB employees who opposed the invasion. A terrifying daily reality for himself, but also for his family, who he has hardly seen since the beginning of the war, in an attempt to keep them safe. Volodymyr has two children with his wife and First Lady Olena, an 18-year-old daughter named Alexandra, and a son, Kirillo, who is only nine. Alexandra has starred alongside Zelensky in the 2014 movie Eight First Dates, playing his on-screen daughter. Presumably your children don't see their father, they can't see the president very much, they must miss him, is that hard for you? You get to see him, but presumably they, they can't. Я дуже сподіваюся, що хоча б моя постійна присутність якось надає їм впевненості і спокою. Батько вони бачать дуже рідко, над довгими епізодами і насолоджуються ними настільки, наскільки можуть. Але ж дійсно нам не вистачає таких моментів, коли ми можемо не рахувати час і просто бути разом і не дивитися на годинник, коли нам Born into a Jewish family, Volodymyr Zelensky grew up in Krivia Ryech, a significant city in central Ukraine. He was raised as a native Russian speaker, but soon acquired fluency in Ukrainian and English. Zelensky was an intelligent and academic student. He earned a law degree from the Krivierich Institute of Economics, but did not go on to work in the legal field. Although Zelensky was licensed to practice law, his career was already heading in a different direction. While still a student, he had become active in theater, which would become his primary focus. At age 17, he joined his local team competing in the KVN comedy competition. In this international competition, 
Teams compete by giving funny answers to questions and showing prepared comedic sketches. He was soon invited to join the United Ukrainian team, which performed in the KVN's Major League and eventually won in 1997. He created and headed the Kvartel 95 team that same year, which later transformed into the Com Kvartel 95. From 1998 to 2003, Kvartel 95 performed in the Major League and the highest open Ukrainian league of KVN. In 2008, he starred in the feature film Love in the Big City and its sequel Love in the Big City 2. Zelensky continued his movie career with the film Office Romance, Our Time, in 2011, and with Rzhevsky vs. Napoleon in 2012. Love in the Big City 3 was released in January 2014. Zelensky also played the leading role in the 2012 film Eight First Dates and two sequels produced in 2015 and 2016. He recorded the voice of Paddington Bear and the Ukrainian dubbing of the 2014 film Paddington and its sequel Paddington 2. In 2015, Zelensky became the star of the television series Servant of the People, where he played the role of the president of Ukraine. In the series, Zelensky's character was a high school history teacher in his 30s who won the presidential election after a viral video showed him ranting against government corruption in Ukraine. In March 2018, members of Zelensky's production company, Kvartel 95, registered a new political party called Servant of the People, the same name as the television program that Zelensky had starred in over the previous three years. Although Zelensky denied any immediate plans to enter politics and said he had only registered the party name to prevent it from being appropriated by others, there was widespread speculation that he was planning to run. Three months before his campaign announcement and six months before the presidential election, he was already a front-runner in opinion polls. After months of ambiguous statements, on December the 31st, less than four months from the election, Zelensky announced his candidacy for President of Ukraine on the New Year's Eve evening show. In place of traditional campaign rallies, he conducted stand-up comedy routines across Ukraine with his production company Kvartel 95. He styled himself as an anti-establishment, anti-corruption figure, although he was not generally described as a populist. He said he wished to restore trust in politicians, to bring professional, decent people to power, and to change the mood and timbre of the political establishment. Zelensky stated that, as president, he would develop the economy and attract investment into Ukraine through a restart of the judicial system and restoring confidence in the state. Volodymyr Zelensky won the first round of elections on March the 31st, 2019. Zelensky took it one stage further in the sort of metaverse by then running as head of a party called Servant of the People to become the actual president. So a guy playing a president on a show is now running for president as head of a party with the name of that show. So you, you know, it's like a sort of endless hall of mirrors. And he won. The idea of the non-politician coming in and a breath of fresh air, cleaning it up, untainted by the past and so on. And Zelensky followed that playbook, you know, very, you know pretty much to the, to the letter. It's, it's a very seductive, you know, as Trump said, drain the swamp. And of course, it's always harder than it looks because because the swamp is so, you know, has is so intertwined. Then Zelensky was criticized for being inexperienced, being lightweight, and again, not taking the advice of his intelligence services on the likelihood of a Russian invasion. But he has taken on the mantle of defender of the, of the, of the faith, as it were. We just ask in the free world, because we are fighting not only for ourselves, but the whole free world. We just ask to help us to protect our skies, to stop this terror and horror. As well as success on the battlefield, wars are often won or lost through information advantage. In the Russia-Ukraine conflict, 
we might have expected Russia, an old hand at propaganda, to have bested Ukraine early on. When Putin came to power, uh, some of the news organizations were actually owned by oligarchs. And, and sometimes these oligarchs could be critical of Putin, and that would obviously be very annoying for Putin. So what does he do? He wrestles back control of those media networks from the oligarchs, and that means that he's in charge of his own message. Propaganda can come in many forms, through media and speech, but also through threats of nuclear force, such as when Russia test-fired a nuclear missile, issuing vague threats of nuclear war in order to deter NATO's support for Ukraine. There was also the strong presence of Russian troops placed on the Russian, Ukraine and Belarus border, said to be a military exercise. These all use the same message, comply or else. You know, you see that with, with Hitler's Germany. Um, you know, was there any kind of publication or, 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 or media agency of the time ultimately not subject to Nazi control? No, none. So a lot is made about, you know, dictatorships being propaganda geniuses. Well, it's not that hard to manipulate the message if you can control every newspaper, every magazine, every TV station, you know, every, every cinema, you name it. Forget it, it's easy. You only have to look at Russian media organizations. Just, just go onto a website like TASS, the Russian news agencies, and there you will see an completely different reality as to what is going on in Ukraine, which of course is called the special operation, as opposed to what any normal sentient being would call it, is a full-blown war. Even with all this Russian propaganda, a lot has proven to be untruthful, dispelling what Russia is trying to convey through the use of media. This has only strengthened Ukraine's underdog success story against the Kremlin's denazification narrative. Zelensky has intuitively grasped the nature of information and electronic communication technology to conduct warfare. He used the power of propaganda and information to his advantage by making it illegal to share images of Ukrainian troops protecting their movements. He also told his people, just after the Russian invasion, that he would give weapons to anyone who wants to defend the country, rallying the patriotic spirit in Ukraine. After Russian propaganda organizations attempted to promote the false claim that Zelensky had fled the capital, he took to the streets and filmed himself defiantly standing in central Kiev. You know, as Napoleon said, I'd rather have lucky generals than good ones. And I'm not sure you would necessarily called the whole invasion of Ukraine lucky. I mean, you know, he's genuinely inspirational. I mean, as a, as a screenwriter, if I'd come up with either of the lines, either um, I need ammunition, not a rise, or when you attack, you'll see our faces, not our backs. If I'd come up with either of those, I'd have just shut the laptop and gone to the pub for the day. I mean, that's, you know, that, that's proper, proper, you know, Hollywood inspirational stuff. The citizens of Ukraine have formed their own successful cyber warfare by forming the IT Army of Ukraine, a volunteer organization created to fight digital intrusion of Ukrainian information and attacking military targets. Zelensky knows that keeping Ukraine's underdog image is crucial to winning the information war by keeping the West, and more specifically NATO, on his side. This has led him to great advantages such as political and military support, the enforcement of a no-fly zone, and admonishing NATO countries for buying oil and gas from Russia in a bid to declare an economic war on Russia. I think sanctions will see Russia returning to what the Soviet Union was like in the bad old days of bread queues, shortages, an almost complete lack of consumerism, you know, good luck, you know, Mr. Oligarch in Moscow servicing your BMW in five years' time if sanctions continue. Where are you going to get the spare parts? You know, it, it's, it, it's going to end up with an absolutely collapsed economy if this continues. And, and, I, and I think this is the end game of, of the Western nations, is to say, right, you know, the more those sanctions hurt, the more likely people power will, will eventually get rid of Putin. That's the hope. It's going to be a very long process. He has become the face of Ukrainian resistance, and his entertainment background has provided Ukraine 
with a weapon for which Putin has no counter. In the information war, the winner was unquestionably Zelensky. It, it, it's not about me, it's more about Russia. They will not have so many chances in the long period to speak with us. The first two years of my presidential term, I, 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 did, I, I did all I could to have meetings with them, to have negotiations with them, to stop the war with them. Why should an actor who had you know, starred in an incredibly popular TV program and had been on Strictly Come Dancing and so on, why should he be good at being a president? I mean, there's, there's, no, there's no reason that he should be. He's not, he has got no government experience, no political experience. It would have been rather amazing if he had been. In terms of, of how the general population um, relate to it, a lot of it is emotion. How many people, you know, even in this country, could give you chapter and verse on any one party's manifesto before an election? No, they, you know, how does Boris Johnson make you feel? How does Keir Starmer make you feel? How does Jeremy Corbyn make you feel? It's a, it's a very visceral reaction. It's, it's, it's a pre-rational reaction. In July 2022, Zelensky was presented with the Sir Winston Churchill Leadership Award by Boris Johnson. Johnson describes Zelensky as having quintessentially Churchillian composure. While Churchill's granddaughter, the Honorable Emma Soames, is quoted as saying, to my mind, there has never been an easier case to make than that for President Zelensky as a wartime leader, showing so many of the same characteristics as my grandfather. Bravery, courage, grace under pressure, and a very close relationship with his people. The parallels go on and on. If we look at Churchill and Zelensky's methods as wartime prime ministers, it's easy to draw comparisons. Politician, officer, and leader, Winston Churchill served as the Prime Minister of Great Britain in arguably some of the most trying times of modern history. After Chamberlain's resignation in 1940, Churchill was appointed during World War II and ultimately led the country along the road to victory. Though he was an undoubtedly skilled strategist and war hero, Churchill's power lay in his eloquence, in his speech and writing. Shortly after Churchill became Prime Minister, he gave one of his most famous speeches, their finest hour. Let us therefore brace ourselves to our duty. So bear ourselves that if the British Empire and its commonwealth last for a thousand years. Men will still say, this was their finest hour. By singleness of purpose, by steadfastness of conduct, by tenacity and endurance, such as we have so far displayed, by these and only by these, can we discharge our duty to the future of the world and to the destiny of man. Churchill's writing skills had gained him international notoriety, and his love for words and the richness of the English language drew him into a career as a writer long before he delved into politics. His ability to communicate clearly and passionately served Churchill well as a revered orator, a popular author, and a most persuasive statesman. A formidable opponent in the debating chamber, Churchill's wit and his skill with words could quickly silence those less erudite and articulate. At the outbreak of the Second Great War in 1939, Sir Winston again answered his country's call as First Lord of the Admiralty. A year later, after the British defeat in Norway, he was drafted into the supreme command of the Empire's war effort as Prime Minister. Three days after his appointment, he was to make his now famous inspirational speech that moved the entire free world with its simplicity and meaning. I have nothing to offer but blood, toil, tears and sweat. 
when weaponry and resources were limited. It was his high-impact speeches that rallied Britons to believe they could win the war. What tragedies, what horrors, what crimes has Hitler and all that Hitler stands for brought upon Europe and the world? They must now know that the stakes for which they have decided to play are mortal. Many people uh, have been astonished that Japan should in a single day have plunged into war against the United States and the British Empire. What is it possible they do not realize that we shall never cease to persevere against them until they have been taught a lesson which they and the world will never forget? Churchill talks about the power of public speaking. He's quoted as saying, of all the talents bestowed upon men, none is so precious as the gift of oratory. He who enjoys it wields a power more durable than that of a great king. He is an independent force in the world. All qualities which Zelensky has in abundance. Battles are fought with weapons. However, the spirit and heart of mankind has proven to lead to victory. A spirit which Churchill managed to rally through his speeches. Zelensky took inspiration from one of his most memorable pieces from 1940, commonly known as, We Shall Fight on the Beaches. He echoed the same message in the hope that it would boost morale and support. We will fight in the forest, in the fields, on the shores, in the streets. We shall defend our island, whatever the cost may be. We shall fight on the beaches. We shall fight on the landing grounds. We shall fight in the fields and in the streets. We shall fight in the hills. We will fight on the banks of the rivers and we are looking for your help, for the help of the civilized countries. We shall never surrender. The president knows that war is as much about information as it is about kinetic warfare. Like Churchill, by balancing values, historical experience, ideals and practical reality, Zelensky is playing the role of president at full throttle. His courage is contagious. Just before Christmas 2022, Zelensky made his first foreign visit since the beginning of the war. On Twitter, he wrote, On my way to visit the US to strengthen resilience and defense capabilities of Ukraine. This visit to Washington felt very reminiscent to Churchill's meeting in 1941 with then-President Franklin Roosevelt, both seeking international aid. The US has been Ukraine's most important ally in the war, committing $50 billion of humanitarian, financial, and security assistance, far more than any other country. Former Secretary of State Hillary Clinton was among US politicians drawing parallels to the former British Premier, saying Zelensky was leading his country with Churchillian courage and resolve. Zelensky addressed Congress using the line, Ukraine holds its lines and will never surrender. Again, echoing the late British Prime Minister, and amplifying his fight for the free world. It's not about I want to talk with Putin. I think I have to talk with Putin. The world has to talk with Putin because there are no other ways to stop this war. So I, think, I think he uses what he has very well, but I think at the heart of it, um, just if nothing else, the simple fact that he stays when he could easily have gone. He could easily have gone, taken the American offer, set up a government in exile somewhere else and done that and he didn't and he and he chose to stay and and there is no way around that other than to to accept that was exceptionally courageous of him it's a slightly sort of medieval thing in a good way you know you are the standard bearer you put yourself in harm's way if need be in the way that you know old leaders used to in the way that medieval knights used to in the way that you know ancient greek leaders used to and that and he has that sense of of of, of responsibility. I wanted to ask you about 
Vladimir Putin because he's in Moscow five or six hundred miles from Kyiv. Yet you and your people must hold him personally responsible for the murder of every child and the rape of every woman. He himself is a father, he has daughters. Do you think he has any conscience or do you think he is simply a monster? The second one. What would your message be to him? I honestly tell you, I don't want to talk to him directly. I don't want to be in this situation. The First Lady, Olena, has been interviewed recently talking about Russian war crimes. Her interview exudes the same strength portrayed to the media, including their fears that the world is now developing war fatigue. When people tell Zelensky how brave he is to be staying and fighting on the ground, his reply is that he is not brave, but instead responsible. Responsible for the country that voted for him as a leader but also responsible for his family, friends, neighbors, and fellow citizens. This is an act that embodies the spirit of Ukraine. Ukraine's national flag features a blue and bright yellow. It has become the symbol of international solidarity with the Ukrainian people and of protest against the Russian invasion. The yellow and blue represent the vast wheat fields beneath the blue skies. Ukraine is also one of the largest exporters of sunflower oil and wheat, which has majorly affected the world's global food security since the Russian invasion. The color yellow is not only seen in the flag, but mirrored in Ukraine's national flower, the sunflower a global symbol of resistance, unity, and hope. A video shows a woman confronting Russian soldiers in Henichesk, Kherson region, urging them to put sunflower seeds in their pockets. You know, we always hear every day, Ukrainians are fighting for democracy and so on. Um, as if their struggle is elevated by our interest in it. Um, Ukrainians are fundamentally fighting for themselves, for their own country, um, which is, you know, as, as it should be. They, they owe us nothing. Um, they owe the wider world nothing. But the wider world has taken it upon themselves to say, this is, this, is, this is a fight for democracy, this is a fight for good values, this is a fight against Putin's values and so on. So in that respect, Zelensky has sort of become a, a, a touchstone for what um, we like to think of as the good guys. Our three countries stand shoulder to shoulder against Russia's barbaric invasion. We're standing up for democracy against authoritarianism and standing with Ukraine. As war and violence once again cast a dark shadow over Europe, we are working together. Zelensky has received many nominations. He was even visited by actor Sean Penn, who gave the president an Oscar from his personal collection to show his support. In December 2022, the president spoke after being named Time Person of the Year. He used it as an opportunity to make one of his most inspiring speeches to date. It is an honor for me to represent the struggle of Ukrainians and the spirit of Ukraine, the spirit of freedom that echoes in the souls of so many people around the world. Stories of heroes who are fighting for independence are also your stories. Ordinary men and women who became brave hearts when they joined the defense forces to defend freedom. Different generations of different nations knew this spirit. Striving for freedom, solidarity, creativity, and dedication, well known to the mankind 
from a long time ago and which united the world this year with the colors of the Ukrainian national flag and our people's achievements. This is the free world spirit. The magazine cover featured not solely the president, but the citizens he spoke about in his speech alongside him. Surrounding them are wheat yellow and sky blue national flags, scattered with beaming sunflowers, conveying a sense of joy, unity and hope. A powerful message with Christmas just around the corner and the cold weather only amplifying as the fight goes on. Zelensky now comes across as very authentic, um, you know, in that, in that respect. And, and, you know, there's pictures of him, the footage of him uh, at Bucha the other day. I mean, you know, the pain on his face was very clear to see. That is, uh, that is an authenticity that people see. You know, he's an actor and there's a degree to which he's using those skills, but I wouldn't for a second say that it was, that it was inauthentic. It may be hyper-authentic in that way. This is a good image, and he's also always in the public figure. He's always, every day almost, he's on television, he's on media, gives some statements, talks, and he talks uh, reasonably. He talks reasonably. He's not just like saying that we are going to beat, we are going to hit, we, we are going to be victorious. He's not saying just this. He's also quite uh, rational. He also talks about peace. Uh, and he keeps saying that this is not something we started, this is not something we initiated, we are defending ourselves, but we want peace at the end. Перемоги і миру, і про це буде просити Святого Миколая. Попросіть разом із нами, якщо це не наївна така бажання, а взагалі, якщо ми говоримо про фізичну допомогу українцям, потрібно пережити зиму. Many other presidents who have experienced similar or even lesser conflict have fled. Yet Zelensky has held his ground, exposing himself to unimaginable danger. Volodymyr Zelensky has solidified his image as Ukraine's hero. He will not stop until he brings his country to victory and most importantly, peace. is unbelievably brave, um, especially for someone with no military training, no law enforcement training, no, no espionage training like Putin has. Um, but, you know, Zelensky with his, with his green T-shirts and his sort of unshaven look and so on, you know, he, suddenly he's a war leader. Despite everything, when he was asked, I remember recently after Ucha, he was asked, are you still willing to sit at the same table with Russian neg negotiators? He says, yes, because our people, our country needs peace. And I think these are good qualities because Ukraine is so significant economically and culturally to, to us, to the, to the rest of Europe and to the region itself, uh, not, not only Europe, Europe and the Middle East and Eastern Europe, or Balkans. He is there as the front man and he's an incredibly um, good, persuasive, brilliant front man. Often without a bulletproof vest or helmet. Some may call him brave, others crazy. Perhaps it is neither, and he is utilizing the tools he has, giving the performance of a lifetime and embodying everything it means to have the spirit of Ukraine.